हेलो व्यूअर्स गुड डे टू ऑल ऑफ यू दिस इज डॉक्टर बी के फॉर यू विद एन अदर टॉपिक टू डिस्कस एंड टूडेज टॉपिक इज मेमरी ग्लैंड नाउ इन द मेमरी ग्लैंड और वी विल बी लर्निंग द मेमरी ग्लैंड अंडर द फॉलोइंग ऑब्जेक्टिव सो द सिचुएशन ऑफ द ग्लैंड इट्स एक्सटर्नल फीचर्स internal structure blood supply nerve supply and lymphatic drainage development of the mammary gland and finally the applied anatomy of the mammary gland now where actually the breast is situated first of all the mammary gland is simply called as the breast or mamma it is bilateral in position and it is also a modified sweat gland so it is situated in the superficial fascia of the pectoral region okay so a bilateral gland situated in the superficial fascia of the pectoral region and a modified sweat gland remember even though it is a gland there is no capsule which is investing your gland like any other gland like your salivary glands or endocrine glands okay now coming to the extent of the mammary gland the vertical extent is from the second to sixth rib so vertically it extends from the second rib to the sixth rib and horizontally it extends from the lateral border of the sternum to the mid axillary line so lateral border of the sternum to the mid axillary line is the horizontal extension of the mammary gland now in females if you look the mammary gland is spherical or conical or pendulous it differs but the base of the gland is mostly circular in shape now this gland shows sudden spot of growth at the onset of puberty or it is called as menarche and it fully develops that is mainly the glandular part which we are going to see after a few slides shows proliferation and the duct enlarges the duct system and the glandular part enlarges mainly during pregnancy and lactation then in the old age again what happens is the shape changes it may also get atrophied because of the loss of the glandular material in males and in prepubertal females it is rudimentary males and prepubertal pubertal females it is rudimentary but in some cases like in males it is enlarged in a condition of kleinfelter's syndrome which is called as gynecomastia okay enlargement of breasts in male is actually called as gynecomastia so mostly in gynecomastia or in some hormonal disturbances people with some hormonal disturbances or people with some liver function impairment in all these cases we can see the enlargement of breast in case of males now what is mammary bed the mammary bed is actually which forms the support for the gland on which the gland rests so the gland rests mainly on top of these three structures the pectoralis major the serratus anterior and the aponeurosis of external oblique abdominis muscle okay so the pectoralis major covered by the pectoral fascia the serratus anterior muscle and 
the external oblique aponeurosis this external oblique aponeurosis separates the mammary gland from one muscle which is present here the rectus abdominis muscle so anteriorly the pectoral is major and laterally what you see is the serratus anterior muscle and inferiorly by the external oblique aponeurosis so inferiorly the external oblique and then the serratus anterior forming part of the mammary bed now even though it appears as if the gland is resting on these three muscles and of course the fascia covering these muscles there is a space between these muscles and the gland so this space is actually called as the retro mammary space mainly filled with the loose connective tissue it is a potential space because there is a free flow of lymphatics and that is actually called as the lake of marsili the retro mammary space so because of the presence of this retro mammary space the gland on top of this is freely movable the gland moves freely because of the presence of the retro mammary space and remember there is a free flow of lymphatics in the retro mammary space then if you divide the gland into four quadrants upper outer quadrant upper inner quadrant lower inner quadrant and lower outer quadrant from the upper outer quadrant sometimes there may be a prolongation of the gland which is actually called as the axillary tail of spines It is a prolongation of the glandular material from the upper outer quadrant. It enters into the axilla through a foramen in the pectoral fascia called as the foramen of Langer. So, there will be opening the pectoral fascia, which is actually called as the foramen of Langer, through which it goes. Sometimes, what happens is if this gland is enlarged. fibro adenoma then it may be mistaken for a lipoma now coming to the relations of the gland we have seen about some of the external features anteriorly it is related to the skin and superficial fascia so the skin is hairy skin the next little below the center of the skin you see a projection which is actually called as the nipple so the nipple is mainly pierced by many ducts of the gland which are the lactiferous ducts so the lactiferous ducts finally open into the summit of the nipple it is mainly present with the smooth muscle erectile tissue that is we have both circular muscle as well as the longitudinal smooth muscle circular and longitudinal muscle which is present in the nipple so what circular muscle is responsible for the elevation and the longitudinal muscle is responsible for the retraction of the nipple so you can see here it is actually pierced by many ducts radially arranged the lactiferous ducts which are converging onto the nipple so it is pierced by almost 18 to 20 ducts and the nipple is lightly pigmented in non pregnant females or nulli pares females during the first pregnancy the nipple gets dark coloration gets pigmented after pregnancy that coloration does not return to the normal coloration which was present so this happens during the first pregnancy and it is a normal process now the base of the nipple you see a circular area which is actually called as the areola the areola is also darkly pigmented and there are some raised margins on the areola which is actually called as the montgomery tubercles these montgomery tubercles mainly provide lubrication to the nipple during lactation 
otherwise what happens the nipple might become dry and there may be cracking of the nipple which produces pain so this motgo meri tubercles which you see here are modified sebaceous gland so that is why the secretor lubricating uh, substance to prevent the nipple from cracking during the lactation so both the nipple and the areola are actually devoid of fat and it is a non hairy skin but richly supplied with sensory nerve fibers so it is a highly sensitive area that is the nipple and the areola so we have so far discussed about the external features of the mammary gland so we have seen the skin of the mammary gland then we have seen about the features the position of the nipple and the lactiferous duct piercing the nipple then followed by the areola which is present at the base of the nipple then about the montgomery tubercles now coming to the parenchyma of the gland here you are able to see inside the gland is made up of many lobes these lobes are actually pyramidal in shape the base is present and deeper and the apex is near to the nipple or areola these lobes are actually radially arranged and there are 15 to 20 lobes so that is why from each lobe a large duct comes 15 to 20 ducts piercing the nipple now if you look at the glandular material they are called as alveoli like branching of grapes how do you see in the alveoli of the lungs in the same way they are tubulo alveolar glands they are tubulo alveolar glands so it is divided into many lobules the ducts give rise to smaller ducts these large ducts gives rise to smaller ducts from the smaller ducts you can see the branching of the terminal ducts the branching of the terminal ducts takes place and at the end of the terminal ducts only you see this bulbous enlargement which is actually the alveoli of the gland so this alveoli of the gland only increases during pregnancy there is enormous development or increase in the number of the alveoli of the gland same way you all would have known that carcinoma of the breast so mainly carcinoma of the breast starts from the ductal epithelium especially the large ducts the ductal epithelium what happens is the carcinoma of the breast starts from there the lobules mainly what happens is are separated from each other each lobe by the fibrous uh, tissue and in between the alveoli you see this fatty tissue which is present here okay so lot of fat is actually deposited and uh, this gives the soft contour of the breast and this fat are all responsive to the hormones so naturally based on the hormones what happens there will be a deposition of fat as well as the development of the alveoli of the glands so all the ducts open into the nipple before opening into the nipple they show a dilatation which is actually called as the lactiferous sinus so the lactiferous sinus acts as the reservoir of the milk during the lactation what happens is it is filled with milk which is ready to be uh, dispersed during the suckling reflex so the glandular part is actually supported by this fibrous stroma so this fibrous stroma anchor the gland to the pectoral wall so they support the gland and divide them into lobes and this fibrous stroma is actually called as the suspensory ligament of cooper is actually called as the suspensory ligament of cooper so in carcinoma of the gland this also gets involved so at the end of this session naturally i am going to speak about the carcinoma of the gland so internal structure the parenchyma of the gland 
mainly made up of fibrofatty stroma and the alveolar material. So what happens is there are numerous ducts, lactiferous ducts, the large ducts, they divide to smaller and terminal ducts which drains many of the alveoli. So each gland has got 50 to 20 lobes and each lobe is drained by a larger duct. The duct shows a dilatation which is actually called as the lactiferous sinus. The blood supply of the gland is mainly from the axillary artery. The lateral thoracic branch gives the lateral mammary branches. Okay. So the lateral thoracic branches from the axillary artery, which is from the second part of the axillary artery. Then from the internal thoracic artery, you are able to see, especially the, the internal thoracic artery gives anterior intercostal arteries, of which the perforating branches of third, fourth, and fifth are very large and they are actually called as the internal mammary artery. So when this supplies the lateral part of the gland, the internal mammary artery, which are branches, perforating branches from the internal thoracic artery, supplies the medial part of the gland. Apart from that, the posterior intercostal arteries of 3rd, 4th and 5th intercostal space also supplies the gland. So the arterial supply is mainly through lateral thoracic artery, internal memory branch of internal thoracic artery and then posterior intercostal arteries of 3rd, 4th and 5th intercostal space. Veins, corresponding veins, so internal thoracic vein again drains and from there it goes to the brachiocephalic vein, axillary vein from the lateral pectoral veins and superior thoracic veins drain into the axillary vein and that continues as the subclavian vein and also from the posterior intercostal veins. Posterior intercostal veins again will drain into the azygos veins. So corresponding veins, internal thoracic, lateral thoracic and superior thoracic from axillary and posterior intercostal veins drain the mammary gland. The nerve supply, you have got sensory nerves as well as the sympathetic nerves. Sensory nerves are from C3, C4 and C5, 4th, 5th, sorry, it's not C3, T3. So 3rd, 4th and 5th intercostal nerves actually supplies the mainly from the anterior and the lateral branches. These are the anterior cutaneous branch and the lateral cutaneous branch from the third, fourth and fifth uh, intercostal nerves. They are nothing but the spinal nerves of the thoracic region. They are involved in this sensory innervation. These intercostal nerves also take care of the sympathetic supply to the gland. Coming to the most important aspect of the lymphatic drainage, so the lymphatics drain by two ways. So one is it drains the skin of the breast excluding the nipple and the areola. So lymphatics of drainage, lymphatic drainage of skin excluding the nipple and the areola. The other one is lymphatics of the parenchyma of the gland without, sorry, with the nipple and the area. So skin excluding the nipple and areola, lymphatic drainage of parenchyma of the gland with or including the nipple and area. Now coming to the lymphatics of the skin, you are able to see various lymph nodes, they are draining. So let us try to understand one by one. The upper outer quadrant or upper lateral quadrant is mainly drained by the axillary lymph nodes. So you have anterior group, posterior group central group and apical group of lymph nodes, the axillary lymph nodes. The inner part is actually drained by the parasternal nodes, since it is present on either side of the sternum, it is actually called as the parasternal nodes. These parasternal nodes again communicate with the opposite parasternal nodes. They are also called as internal mammary nodes, the inner part. Okay, the upper outer part by the axillary nodes and the inner part by the parasternal nodes or internal mammary nodes. From the upper part they drain directly into the supraclavicular nodes. The supraclavicular nodes here you see here are part of the deep cervical nodes, lower deep cervical nodes, okay. outer part from the supraclavicular nodes 
and from the lower part they drain via the subdiaphragmatic plexus into the abdominal nodes. They may go to hepatic nodes below the diaphragm. So mainly they go to the axillary nodes, they go to supraclavicular nodes, they go to internal memory nodes and also to the abdominal lymph nodes in the wide area of drainage of the memory gland. Now coming to the lymphatics of the glandular part, so far we have seen about the lymphatics of the skin excluding the nipple and the areola. Now coming to the lymphatics of the gland, it is in the form of two plexus. One is below the nipple and area you have a sub areolar plexus which is actually called as the sapis plexus. Then one more, I already told you the retromammary space consists of free flow of lymphatics. Now, what happens is both these, the sub areolar plexus and the retromammary plexus, they actually communicate with each other freely. After the communication of the lymphatics between the sub areolar plexus and the sapis plexus and the retromammary plexus, lymph from the glandular material drains in the following way. 70% of the lymph drains via the axillary lymph nodes that is the anterior and posterior group of axillary lymph nodes. Posterior lymph nodes present along the axillary tail in the posterior wall of axilla. Anterior lymph nodes present along the lateral thoracic vein in the anterior wall of the axilla. From there, the lymph will go to the central lymph nodes, central group of axillary nodes and from there they go to the apical nodes. From there, they might also communicate to the supraclavicular nodes. Twenty percent of the lymph from the glandular part drains by the internal thoracic vessels or veins to the parasternal nodes, and five percent from the posterior intercostal nodes. Okay. Some also cross the midline and go to the opposite parasternal nodes from the inner part. So again I repeat, 70% into the axillary lymph nodes via the anterior and posterior group, from there they go to the central and from there they go to the apical lymph nodes. All these lymph from collected from these areas will go to the apical and the supraclavicular nodes also they might communicate. 20% via the internal memory nodes of which some may cross to the opposite side and goes also to the opposite internal memory nodes parasternal nodes, 5% via the posterior intercostal nodes. So, we have seen about the blood supply, we have seen about the venous drainage, nerve supply and lymphatic drainage of the breast. Now, coming to the age changes of the breast, from birth to puberty, it is rudimentary. Lactiferous duct is present, but there is no alveolar material. The nipple is present. It appears just uh, before birth, it gets inverted, but areola appears only after 4 to 5 months. In the neonates, you can see the areola is absent. Inversion of the nipple takes place just before birth. In some, in some neonates, again, it might also take at a later stage. Even in the males, the breast is rudimentary, but the duct system is present. Now, at the onset of puberty, what happens is due to the secretion of the estrogens, the ducts branch profusely due to the hormone estrogen. Same way, the progesterone influences for the development of the alveoli. So, what happens is they form some spherical masses which are precursor to alveoli. So, once this mass, what happens? They get, uh, they are lined by epithelium, then only they become a paka alveoli. So, slowly what happens is the developing alveoli has spherical mass and they are actually what happens is influenced by the progesterone. Now, in the pregnancy, what happens is proliferation and growth of alveoli mainly, lot of alveoli increase, granular or secretory material. With the growth of the ducts, both actually take place. 
Due to this, what happens is the breast expands. Now, what makes the growth of the ducts and alveoli is the placental hormone, the hormones which is secreted by the placental estrogens. Again, placenta secretes some estrogens because of that, and also due to their increased blood flow to the gland during the pregnancy. Now, next, what happens is lactation starts. In the later stages of pregnancy itself, there is a secretion which is actually called as the colostrum. So, the colostrum mainly consists of flat molecules. They are present in the form of secretory vacuoles, phagocyte cells and fat molecules are present. Lactation only starts few days after the parturition. So, when there is a suckling reflex, which induces to secrete oxyotoxin and helps in milk ejection. And maintenance of lactation is mainly under the control of these two hormones, the prolactin and the growth hormone which is actually secreted from the pituitary gland. Anterior lobe of the pituitary gland secretes prolactin and the growth hormone. So, oxyotoxin is responsible not only for milk rejection, we also know during parturition for the contraction of the uh, smooth muscle of the uterus, myometrium of the uterus, this oxyotoxin is responsible. Now, after 6 months, what happens is the lactation stops, but it is definitely not after 6 months. If the mother continues to actually feed the baby, then lactation continues even up to 1 year or 1 and a half years also. But the ideal time they tell is up to the 6 months. So, once the lactation stops, then naturally the alveoli shrink and gland returns to resting position, but not to the normal position. So, the gland shrinks, so because of the shrinkage of the alveoli. So, now coming to the development of the breast, so it is actually a ectodermal derivative. You can see this is actually called as the milk ridge which starts from the groin region up till the axilla. Okay? And the glandular part is derived from the ectoderm as I told you, the duct and the alveoli. Whereas the fibrofatty stroma the fat and the fibrous material that is the suspensory ligament of Cooper is actually a mesodermal derivative. Now, this milk ridge what happens which appears from the inguinal region the seventh week of development. 7th week of intrauterine life. In humans, most of this milk ridge, what happens? It disappears and only persists in the pectoral region and this is going to give rise to the breast tissue. So, rest of it definitely, it disappears. If at all it is present, it might give rise to some developmental anomalies. Axillary tail of spence, if it is present, is nothing but the upper part of this milk ridge which persists as the axillary tail. Okay? So, mainly the glandular part, remember it is actually a ectodermal derivative. Okay. Now, what happens is the applied aspects coming is the breast carcinoma. So, we all know what is breast carcinoma, it is more common. In which age of woman it is very common? Woman and the menopausal or perimenopausal stage, the breast carcinoma is more chances. So, the cancer cells, what happens is they invade, mainly the fibro fatty tissue is involved. Naturally, what happens is they get fibrosed and the breast gets fixed to the underlying chest wall. So, the breast is no more freely movable if it is invaded by this cancer cells. Then, what happens is the next condition you see here a dimpling of skin takes place. Skin dimples takes place that is because of the involvement again of the ligament of Cooper. It is getting fibrosed. So, skin gets spitted and the lymphatics don't get drained, they get blocked because all the lymph nodes gets enlarged 
in cancerous but when a lymph node gets enlarged it necessarily need not be cancer but in cancer definitely the lymph nodes will get enlarged especially the axillary lymph nodes because that is responsible for the lymphatic drainage of the breast. So in the edematic condition and you see pitted with the edematous condition it appears like the skin of the orange and it is called as the pudy orange condition. It is pudy orange appearance due to the lymph obstruction. Then retraction of the nipple takes place because the ducts as I told you mainly the cancer starts in the larger ducts and breast gets fixed to the underlying tissue. So retraction of skin, beauty orange condition, nipple retraction and any tumors of the breast you can see it is not smooth but an abnormal contour, a lump or mass which is hard to feel. It is not soft but hard to feel and if it is present for more than a month or so then naturally what happens is it is better to get it diagnosed and mostly any tumor will be diagnosed only through most commonly diagnostic procedures are FNAC, fine needle aspiration cytology, mammogram. So mainly they go for a mammogram, only in the mammogram you will be able to visualize the lymph vessels. Okay. So carcinoma of breast, mainly retraction of the nipple, dimpling of skin, pudy orange condition takes place and the breast gets fixed. So enlargement of the lymph node takes place, axillary and the deep cervical lymph nodes. Now metastasis, now from there what happens, where can this cancer spread to? One is it can spread to the opposite breast, why because parasternal nodes, the inner part of the breast, some of the lymphatics cross to the opposite side, it drain to the opposite side, so definitely there is a chance of spread to the opposite nodes. So this all takes place at a bit later stage or stage 2 or stage 3. So in the beginning stages itself it is diagnosed all this can be prevented very easily. Now what happens is then subdiaphragmatic plexus we have already told you the lower part of the breast via the subdiaphragmatic plexus drains into the abdominal nodes, hepatic nodes in the same way what happens is it can spread to the ovaries and that is called as Krukenberg's tumor. So this is transylomic through your peritoneum. It can spread to the ovary, it can also spread to your liver. So distant places it can spread and that is why it is actually called as metastasis. This is actually advanced stage. It can also spread to your vertebra. So and from there the vertebral canal naturally via the spinal cord and naturally it can also enter your brain because once it goes to the abdomen, Batson plexus, through this venous plexus of Batson's internal vertebral venous plexus, it communicates with the, what happens in the lumbar region mainly it communicates. So once it reaches the abdomen from that to the internal vertebral venous plexus, the communicating between this intervertebral venous plexus and the lymphatics of the abdomen is the Batson means. Through this, it can also spread to your brain. So, it can spread to your brain, it can brain spread to your distance organ. All this is because of the metastasis. Same way, if you detect a mass on one breast unilaterally, definitely what happens is you have to examine the axillary lymph nodes of both these sides examining only once or palpating the axillary lymph nodes of one side is always incomplete because there is always chance of spread of the tumor, uh, the cancer to the opposite breast. Same way, based on the size of the tumor, if it is very small up to 4 centimeters, it can be excised, excision. So that is you actually cut it and remove the tumor and follow up with chemotherapy. If the tumor is large then naturally what happens is we have to go for a procedure which is called as radical mastectomy. So removal of the breast 
and not only the removal of the breast along with that all the axillary lymph nodes and sometimes the deep cervical lymph nodes has to be removed to prevent the further spread of the cancers of the breast now sometimes you come across some mass which is soft in texture and that is actually benign fibroadenoma so benign means it is not malignant it does not spread so benign fibroadenoma more common in the young females whereas carcinoma is more common in the females above the age of 40 so benign fibroadenoma is a soft and freely movable lump it will not be hard or stony hard or fixed like you are a carcinoma. This might be due to overgrowth of some of the lobules, the glandular part, but not the ductal part, and more common in young females. Sometimes inflammation of the lactiferous ducts is actually called as galactosine. Most commonly, it might take place during lactation. Some infections so naturally, what happens? Proper care has to be taken so that uh, it does not affect the baby. So developmental anomalies we have already seen that the breast develops from the milk ridge sometimes absence of breast milk ridge does not develop or it may completely disappear it is called as amastia. Presence of more than two breasts is actually called as polymastia. Athelia is absence of nipple and polythelia is actually presence of supernumerary nipples and gynecomastia this I already told you the beginning of this lecture itself is enlargement of male breast most commonly seen in the Klein-Felters syndrome. Now here I would also like to stress one point is the male breast also I told you the alveolar part is not present and the fat component but the duct system is present. I do, um, you know very well that I mentioned that the larger ducts are mainly responsible for the carcinoma, where carcinoma starts, there are mainly the larger ducts. So, even in male breast, that is, since the ducts are present, carcinoma is possible in the male. But what happens is, males, the breast has again got a very rich lymphatic drainage, more richer than the female breast. So, if at all carcinoma affects the male breast, then the prognosis of this cancer is very poor in case of the males. So, thank you very much for listening to this lecture on a mammary gland. So, mammary gland is a very, very important topic. It might be asked as an essay question in the university examinations. And of the whole of the mammary gland, more important is the lymphatic drainage of breast. So, you should be very thorough with the lymphatic drainage of breast and you know why because cancers of the breast spread through the lymphatic drainage. So, please concentrate much on the lymphatic drainage of the breast. So, thank you once again and we will meet again in some other topic.